What's up everybody, and welcome to this week's edition of Da Vinci Cases. Alright, so the way this works is we've got a clinical case followed by a board style question. So we're going to go through the question stem, point out the relevant clinical findings, take a look at the question and the answer choices, and then kind of divert for a minute and go through the relevant concepts to answering the question. Then we'll come back and apply those concepts that we went over to answering the question. Alright, so we have a 52 year old woman that presents to the emergency department with a seizure. She has no prior history of seizures, which this is really important because epilepsy is typically diagnosed in younger patient populations. When you have a middle-aged or older patient that's presenting with a new onset seizure, they've never had a seizure before, you definitely want to be thinking about an intracranial mass. Now, that, some examples of what that could be is you could have a tumor, you can have an abscess, you can have a bleed potentially. So it could be any of these things. And so you definitely want to keep that in mind, when you, especially when you see it on these, on these exams like this. The other thing with seizures is you want to also be thinking of the temporal lobe. Typically, masses impinging on the temporal lobe can, ca can typically cause seizures if they become large enough and, and compress it enough. So going forward here, she reports experiencing headaches for the past month that are worse in the morning. So she's got headaches, which very commonly seen with, with intracranial masses. It also could just be, you know, your standard run-of-the-mill headache. She's been having it for a significant period of time. And the fact that it's worse in the morning, that can often tip you off to increased intracranial pressure. Two reasons for that. So when you wake up in the morning, you've been lying down all night, right? So you've been lying down all night, that increases blood flow to your head because there's, there's less gravity there versus when you're standing up. And so there's less gravitational resistance. So you have increased blood flow to the brain. The other thing is when you're sleeping, you don't ventilate as much, so you have a higher PCO2. And so PCO2 causes vasodilation, which also increases blood flow. And so these two together help contribute to increased intracranial pressure, which if you have a mass in there, those all together can cause significant increases in intracranial pressure, which could lead to headaches that would be worse in the morning. So that's the significance of that. Her vitals are within the normal range, and there's no significant findings on physical exam. So she has normal vitals, she has a normal temperature, so that decreases my suspicion that it would be an infectious cause to, this, to her symptoms, such as an abscess. The other thing is she's hemodynamically stable. There's also no findings on physical exam. So if she were having like a stroke or, in, or an infarction, you often would see some kind of weakness, facial droop maybe, you could see some sensory deficits. Again, doesn't totally rule those things out, but it decreases your suspicion a little bit. She has no significant past medical history and does not take any medications. The significance of that is that, you know, some medications, if you go off of them or, or they could have side effects of seizures potentially. The other thing is, you know, she could be like a diabetic and overtaking her insulin, which could severely decrease her blood sugar, also could potentially cause a seizure as well. But it doesn't seem like that's the case here since she doesn't have any significant past medical history and she's not on any medications. So a patient comes in like this, they have a new onset seizure, middle age, older patient. The next step you're going to do is you're going to get some imaging because you want to confirm your suspicion that it's an intracranial mass. So the imaging, as you can see here on the right, reveals an intracranial mass. Neurosurgery is consulted for surgical resection of the mass. So let's take a look at here of the imaging. So in radiology, you're looking, it's as if you're looking at the feet of the patient and looking up. So this would be the right side, this would be the left side, this is the right side, this is the left side. So what, the, what these are are a T1 post-contrast MRI, and this is an axial view, and this is a coronal view. Axial would be like you're taking horizontal slices through. Coronal view is, is essentially looking at the face and then taking slices there. And so if you look, you have a very large mass here in the temporal lobe. It's a very heterogeneous mass with some rim enhancement, as you can see here, and then central necrosis. You can see that as well here on the coronal view as well. These are typically signs of a, of a highly malignant mass. You can also see that it's within the brain parenchyma, especially here on the coronal, and then also here on the axial as well. And so it's, your suspicion would be that it's uh, you know, a brain tumor. It could be a metastasis. Again, she doesn't have any prior history of cancer, but again, she, she could have some undiagnosed primary cancer that's metastasized to the brain. The other thing it could be is a primary brain tumor, such as a glioblastoma. Now, for the sake of the question here, it's asking which of the following visual field defects is this patient at risk for developing after surgical resection? So really, it doesn't really matter what the diagnosis is as far as answering this question. 
what the question's really asking you is, which of these visual defects is this patient at risk for developing as a result of the temporal lobe being operated on and having a mass removed from it? So what we need to do now is go through the visual pathway and see what part of the visual pathway is traveling in the temporal lobe that could potentially be affected by this surgery. So again, it's a temporal lobe mass. This is the right side, the left side. Now on this image, it's flipped here. So you have their left visual field here, right visual field here. So this is gonna be left and right, it's gonna be flipped. Here's your left eye, here's your right eye. Your eyes are split into superior quadrants and inferior quadrants, and then left-sided and right-sided fields. So left side, right side. And so if we briefly walk through the visual pathway here. So if you look at here at the retina level, this outer portion of the, of the retina is going to take inputs from this inner visual field or left side of visual field. And then this inner portion of the retina here is going to take inputs from this outer portion here. Same thing here. So you're having crisscross. Then they travel in the optic nerve. And then you have fibers crossing over here in the optic chiasm, which we'll talk about on the next slide. Then fibers travel within here. It's not labeled, which is called the optic tract. So these fibers travel here. And then the fibers synapse on the lateral geniculate nucleus, or the LGN, and then they split. And so you have fibers, to further demonstrate this, you have what's called the optic radiations, which are traveling in the parietal lobe. And then at a perpendicular or at a 90 degree angle to that, you have what's called Myers loop, which is traveling in the temporal lobe. Now, Myers loop is carrying inputs from the contralateral superior quadrants. So that would be these guys and these guys. And then the optic radi radiations are carrying inputs from the contralateral inferior quadrants. So this is on the right side. It's going to be the left inferior quadrants, as you can see here. Then these fibers traveling within these tracks, then synapse here in the occipital lobe at the primary visual cortex. So let's go through the answer choices here. So again, we start here at the eye. If you were to have a lesion at the optic nerve, you would just lose an entire eye. As you can see, that doesn't really correspond to any of the answer choices here because the other eye would be normal. So it's definitely not an optic nerve lesion. So next we travel to the optic chiasm. So what's interesting here about the optic chiasm is if you look here, these inner visual fields, so on this side and the left eye, it's gonna be taking this outer portion here. And then on the right eye, it's gonna be taking this outer portion here. So this blue fiber comes in here and it crosses over to this side, over to the left to join this other blue fiber here. And then this red fiber corresponding to the inputs to the inner portion of the retina, which is receiving inputs from the outer left visual field. This is gonna come over here and cross over here. So if you have a lesion at the optic chiasm, you're interrupting these crossing over of these fibers that are receiving inputs from these outer visual fields like this. And so what that's gonna give you is what's called a bitemporal hemianopia or tunnel vision. So that corresponds to answer A. Now remember our lesions out here in the temporal lobe, so this seems less likely. So after the optic chiasm, we're traveling here in the optic tract. Now remember, this is before you split into that Myers loop and optic radiations, which are Myers loops carrying inputs from the superior quadrants, and then the optic radiations are carrying inputs from the inferior quadrants. So you still have both quadrants together. And so at this point, this is the right side, this is the left side. And so you're gonna be impacting inputs coming from this outer visual field or this left side of the left eye here, which is gonna be here. And it's, you're in the optic tract, it's before you've split. So you have both quadrants represented, both the superior and the inferior. And then if you look at this other red fiber that's traveling here that corresponds to inputs to this outer portion of the retina is gonna be again, this left side here of the right eye, this left half of the visual field of the right eye. Again, the superior and the inferior quadrant. So a lesion in the optic tract is gonna to lead to this lesion here, which is called a left-sided hanominous hemianopia. It's on the right optic tract. It's the contralateral side because of this crossing over that we show here. And so this would be the lesion here. Now the optic tract, again, is not part of the temporal lobe. And so this is less likely to be the answer choice. So now we get into the lateral geniculate nucleus, and then we scan a split into those optic radiations and Myers loop. So Myers loop, if you affect that, that's carrying fibers from the contralateral superior quadrants. So we're in the right side, the right temporal lobe. So that's gonna be carrying inputs from 
the left-sided superior quadrant of the left eye and the left superior quadrant of the right eye. So you're going to lose both of these quadrants here, and that would correspond to answer C. So given that this is a temporal lobe tumor, you're carrying out a surgical resection within the temporal lobe, definitely Myers loop could be at risk for being impacted. And so that would again re result in a left-sided superior quadrantopia, which is shown here in answer C. So just for completeness sake, the optic radiations are carrying from these guys here on the right side are going to be carrying inputs from the left inferior quadrants of both the left eye and the right eye. So these guys here. So if it were affecting the parietal lobe, where it would be affecting the optic radiations, it would be this answer choice D here, which is a left inferior quadrantopia. Now, given that the tumor is in the temporal lobe, it seems more likely that it's, this is going to be your answer choice. And so if we come back here, again, this temporal lobe tumor, very large. You can see both on the axle and the coronal. Any kind of surgery in here, you could be impacting Myers loop, which should then give you a left-sided superior quadrant navia. So just a follow-up question here. They're asking which of the following features are most likely to be seen on histopathology of this mass. So you surgically take this mass out. The next step is you got to confirm the diagnosis. So you send it to the pathology lab. They're going to send you some histology slides, and you would look at features that would be characteristic of a specific diagnosis. Now, to answer this question, unfortunately, you just have to kind of memorize or know what each of these buzzwords or characteristics correspond to. And so what we're going to use is we're going to use the imaging corresponding to what each of these represent to see if we can figure out what the most likely choice is. So first, diffuse masses of small and differentiated round cells with rosette formation. And you can see that here, uh, numerous blue cells, they form around these peach colored or, or red colored formations here, which would be the rosette formation like this. This corresponds to a medulloblastoma. A medulloblastoma is a tumor typically seen in children. So again, we have a middle-aged woman here, doesn't usually fit the profile. The other thing is medulloblastoma is a posterior fossa tumor, often seen in the cerebellum. Again, doesn't correspond to the imaging either. So that seems less likely to be the answer choice. So our next answer choice, high cellularity, microvascular proliferation, and then pseudopalisading of cells around necrotic areas. In a, in a general sense, these are characteristics of a very malignant tumor, high cellularity, so cells are rapidly dividing, microvascular proliferation, this corresponds to angiogenesis, which is where you're having new blood vessel formation to help feed these rapidly dividing cells. And then what happens is, is that these cells are, are dividing so rapidly that they essentially outgrow their blood supply and then they die off and develop necrosis. And then what happens is you have this pseudo palisading of cells. And you can see that from a zoomed out portion here. You can see that. And then if you zoom in, you can really see it nicely here. Here's the necrotic area. Then you can see this kind of pseudo stacking of cells around these necrotic areas. Now, these characteristics are hallmark histology for a glioblastoma, which again is a highly malignant primary brain tumor, which would definitely correspond. This imaging is very, very characteristic of a glioblastoma. You have this rim enhancement. It's a heterogeneous mass with this central necrosis like this. It's found within the brain parenchyma. So this seems like a, a, it could be a winner for us. Let's go through the rest of the answer choices to confirm, though. So cells arranged in perivascular pseudo rosettes. So perivascular around a blood vessel, you can see that here. Here's those red blood cells in red here with, within the blood vessel. And then you see this pseudo rosette, reddish or pinkish colored uh, rosette around the blood vessel. And then you see the cells crowding around it like this. This is characteristic of a, of a pendymoma. Again, this is a posterior fossa tumor. Again, doesn't really correspond to our imaging here with a temporal lobe tumor. Lastly, spindle cells arranged in a whorl pattern with somoma bodies. So here on this slide here, you can see this whorl pattern of cells like this. And then here you can really see those somoma bodies, which are these hyalinized, crystallized structures within the tumor like this. And these are characteristic of a meningioma. A meningioma is typically a benign tumor. The other thing is meningiomas arise from the meninges. So you typically will see them here originating from the meninges, such as at the falks, or you could even see them just out here. And they're going to be tethered to some aspect of the meninges versus this tumor is found within the brain parenchyma and the other thing about meningiomas is on imaging they're typically more homogeneous versus this tumor is very heterogeneous in appearance on, on imaging so again would decrease our suspicion for a meningioma again we're going with what's the most likely and so 
it's most likely that this would be a glioblastoma that when surgically resected and when looked under microscopy you would see these cellular features of the tumor all right that's all i have for you this week make sure you check back every wednesday for new da vinci cases in the meantime subscribe to our channel for more videos and then be sure to download the pdf notes for this video on our website at dviacademy.com also on our site you can find our book and video packages for anatomy and biochemistry and if you want to listen to da vinci cases on the go the audio is available on Spotify. You can also follow us on Instagram for weekly posts and video. And then lastly, if you have any questions about the content of this video or about DaVinci Academy, put them in the comments and our team will be sure to answer them. All right, thanks for watching. We'll catch you next time.